Hey, good morning. My name is Jeff. I'm part of the teaching team here at Rainier View Christian Church, and we are beginning a brand new teaching series today on yes regrets, because the reality is all of us experience regrets in life. We have them, we will experience them in the future, and yet we don't have a great way to talk about them. We don't necessarily have a great way to understand what to do with our regret, because many of us right now are holding on to regrets that sounds something like this. Uh, what if, what if I had just done the work sooner? What if I had just done the right thing? What if I had just taken that chance? What if I just reached out to that one person? Right? And all of us have these different regrets and the situations look different, but a lot of the themes are the same. In fact, there's a fascinating website that contains the World Regret Survey where you can post anonymously your regrets. And so I just pulled up the state of Washington and I want to read a few uh, of the regrets that people had shared there. Female 63 wrote in, I regret not marrying the man who probably should have been my husband. Male 57 wrote, I regret not maintaining a good relationship with my kids and now I'm a grandfather who has never met his granddaughter. Female 60 wrote, I regret being so harsh with my son as a teenager. I was trying to use tough love to stop him from making the same mistakes I did, and it didn't work. What he really needed was more unconditional love. You know, and our culture tells us that it's possible somehow to live with no regrets, right? This is, there's, you know, memes all around this. Uh, but in the reality, right, like our culture wants us to think that there's a way to live with either no regrets or very, very few regrets. But that's simply not true. We are imperfect people with a collection of different weaknesses and, and experiences in our past and in our present. And so we are going to have regrets. The question is, how do we process those regrets so that we are not limited, held back, and, and allow them to run the way we live our lives in the present? And so the, the thing that faith does and allows us to do is to experience hope, and freedom and healing and a way to frame our regrets differently and process them well. And so you can come to terms with the regrets that you have from your past, as well as the regrets that you are processing and wrestling through right now in your life. Because God intends for us to experience something different when it comes to following in the way of Jesus. In John 10, 10, this is what Jesus says. He says that I come, or I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so here's the thing though. We want this full life. We want this abundant life as some uh, other translations inter uh, interpret that, that phrase that Jesus uses there as. But how do I, how do I have this full abundant life and, and match that with the reality that I'm going to have regrets? Uh, and so the question really is, are we going to allow the regrets to define us? For example, I have shared here at Rainier View part of my story of really in, in our 20s, um, not really having a set budget that we lived off of. Uh, again, weren't living extravagantly, just weren't being intentional about our plan of how to use our money. And so then in 2007, the, the housing market was really hot and the wisdom was just buy something, anything, because in a couple years, you're gonna walk away with tens of thousands of dollars in equity. So buying a uh, condo in a bad neighborhood in 2007 in a suburb of Los Angeles ended up being a great, nope, a terrible idea. And so that season, that chapter in the moment was one that was marked for me by a sense of shame, by a sense of failure when it came to how we were managing our finances. But understanding, going through that and reframing that has helped me to see that, no, I can reframe this in the story of God's grace that God took a season that was painful and he was able to use that to teach me something about who he is and his control and presence in my life that, that I couldn't have otherwise learned. But it was, only, it was only because of my faith that I was able to reframe that, that story that was one of shame and failure and God used it for good. God used it as a redemptive way that I can encourage others, that I could see God at work and be present. And, it's an important kind of sidebar here to note that in that season, we were actively giving 
generously, sacrificially. We were tithing in that season that we had this happen. And so just giving generously, that, man, that's a huge step that many of us need to lean into and take, and it's a spiritual rhythm that we need to, to live out. But you also need to have a plan to, to manage your finances wisely and well from God's point of view. If you're joining us right now and you're like, yep, yeah, I need that plan, uh, message us, reach out. We would love to connect you with some tools to help you with that. But for today, we're going to begin by looking at Matthew 20. And we're going to look at a story that Jesus tells that will help us better frame uh, the regrets that we are holding on to and process them in a better and a more helpful way. Uh, and really beginning with that, with one kind of set of regrets, the regrets that revolve around, if I had only done the work, if I'd only done the work, right? We hold on to this regret and we think about uh, if I'd only done the work in this area of my life earlier on, I would be so much further along in life. However you define further along in life, right? If only I had done the work to experience a better relationship in my marriage, man, where would things be? If I had only done the work to be in a different spot in my profession right now, man, what, what would be? Okay, and here's what you need to understand as we step into this story from Matthew 20 that we're going to jump into in a moment is this. This truth hopefully will become clear as we go through the story. Don't let regret define you. Don't let regret keep you from seeing that the right time to do the work is today. Don't walk away from, from this moment without understanding in a, in a deeper, more real way that regret doesn't have to keep you from doing the good work that God wants you to do today. And so uh, let's begin. We're going to kind of just read the whole story. We're going to understand the original context and then see what it means to us today. So Matthew, uh, beginning uh, chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. At about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am being generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now, I have a confession to make as a pastor around this parable. This is the least favorite story that Jesus tells in all of the Bible for me. This story always irks me. Uh, because why? Jesus is encouraging people to be lazy and do less work. How could this be the case? I love the way one commentator put it. He, he writes it this way. He says, little seems more unequal than the equal treatment of unequals. But as I've sat with this story, as I've asked myself, why does that irritate me? What's, what's going on for me? I've come to understand how shallow my understanding of God's grace really is. Uh, because this touches upon the regret that really is tied to buying the lie of which there's partial truth of the American dream. That as long as you work hard, you will be able to achieve anything your heart desires. Okay? And that's just simply untrue. Okay? Let me give you an example. 
um, I was recently talking with a neighbor and we were just um, hanging out, sitting on his porch and just talking about life in general. And he's retired. And so he was talking to me about uh, his first marriage. And he was sharing with me how in that, in that first marriage, he just thought, you know, what it meant to be a good husband was just to work hard and provide for the family. So that was the framework of, uh, again, successful marriage, success, successful family. And so because of that, he worked a ton of hours and he was rarely home and rarely present. And, and as they had kids, was rarely able to be present with them. And so as a result of that lens, that mindset, right, he had not done the work <clears throat> to make that marriage last. And so that first marriage for him ended. And so, right, there, there could be regret there around, well, if I had only done the work sooner, what well, could have been different? And so, you know, but he had done that process, he'd done that work to come to terms with, again, not allowing that regret to keep him from doing good and having a healthy marriage in his present. And so I think for both of us, um, both for my neighbor and, and, as well as myself, what I've come to discover is that we both viewed our own ability as the pathway to make our lives successful. Because here's the thing, we all have areas where we have some level of success or some level of control or some level of things going right. And then we all have areas that, man, we would say we're not doing well. Uh, it's not going well professionally or physically or emotionally or spiritually or, or whatever, with raising my kids or my family dynamics, right? We, we all have different things. In fact, if you think you've done everything right and there is nothing uh, that you have to regret ever in, in any of the days of your life, uh, that's a whole different message on self-righteousness, which we're not in right now in this moment. Um, but Nobody likes a self-righteous jerk. So we all have regrets. We all have areas and ways that we come up short. The question is, what do we do with those regrets? Because the, the story that Jesus tells here in Matthew 20 and what it, it teaches us is that we can realize that the grace of God is available to any and all of us uh, to, reframe our, to reframe our regret, to understand that God can redeem any moment, any season of our life. And so let's look a bit more closely at each piece of this story to best understand how it speaks to the regrets that you have about not starting sooner and not allowing regret to keep you from doing the work that God wants for you to do today. So the story opens in verse one, it says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. At about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. Okay, and so first off, right off the bat, don't miss this detail that God is clearly the God of not just first chances, but second, third, fourth, fifth chances. His, his grace continues to be extended over and over again. Uh, and so there are opportunities always to respond to the work that God wants for us to do. And that it, in the, and it contrasts with the economy of the world. The economy of the world is you better hustle, you better work hard, and you need to, you need to start there and you need to continue there. And if you don't, it's going to be game over for you. Okay? But in the economy of grace that we see in this parable, this story that Jesus tells, it is never too late to respond to the work that God has for us to do right now. Again, we don't want you to be held back by regret. Don't let regret keep you from seeing that the right time to begin doing the work that you need to do is today. Because our regrets around, man, if I had only done this work earlier, usually connect back to things that we want to either have or what we want to experience in our lives. This is where this regret connects to. Uh, and so I wanna uh, read, a, read a quote here, the researcher Daniel Pink. This is the way he talks about regret and its ability to truly clarify what we value. He says it this way, what we regret exposes what we value. And I think that's the beginning place to reframe and redeem the role of regret in our life. It can have a positive use and effect if we allow it to speak to what we truly value. Because when we, fit, when we feel like we've missed the opportunity because we didn't start early enough, 
that there are things that, are, that we're going to miss out on because we just didn't get started with it right away. Man, in God's economy of grace, it is never too late to align our lives to God's kingdom values. We can get started with that today, no matter how much failure we think we've accumulated, no matter how late in life we're coming to approach it. It is never too late in God's economy to, to, to align our lives with God's kingdom values, or as we say here at Rainier View, to be a difference maker. Now, it is true that the earlier you start working on goals, like the greater the chance of success that you'll have in achieving them. But that's not to say that often the pursuits of our lives align with God's kingdom values. Because the values that we often align our lives around, often, again, uh, those of us in the church and outside can look very similar, right? We want more comfort. We want, we want luxuries like travel and bigger houses and bigger, newer trucks and cars. We want, uh, we want a retirement account that is recession and inflation proof, right? Why? So that we can feel like I'm secure in what I have, right? These experiences are allowing me to live some version of the good life. But are those values aligned with the values that Jesus lives out and talks about? They aren't. <laughs> Look with, with me just at one, uh, one kind of action of Jesus and one statement that he gives to any and all of us who'd want to follow in the pathway of Jesus. In Luke 9, we read this. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Okay? Grasp this. Jesus was literally homeless relying on the generosity of others to take him in and to care for him in order to do the work of the kingdom of God, to see people become, uh, be made right with God and right with each other. And he willingly lived a very different life than most would choose. And what's the value that he invites all of us into? In Matthew 6, this is what we read out of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most complete teachings. He says, but seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Meaning, not all the things we want and desire and an opulent life or an extravagant life for ourselves, no, but that as we trust God's values, as we live out of those values, God will provide for our basic needs. Not necessarily all things we want, but the things that we truly need. And so God has work for each and every one of us based upon those values. And so whether you are late to the marketplace uh, or, or not, all are called to some of these kingdom values like this. Like w as we read in the New Testament, things like we're called to be an encouragement to one another, to be an encouraging person. We're called to be people who seek reconciliation with one another, which means you go first to admit where you've brought pain and hurt into a relationship. You repent, you apologize, you seek forgiveness, and not expecting the other person to do anything in return. That's a kingdom value that, by and large, we don't live out very well. Um, we're called to practice certain disciplines or rhythms in order to enrich and develop a spiritual life. And maybe we're late to the party in living those out. But again, Jesus teaches us that missing out on opportunities is not the end of our story. Don't let regret keep you from pursuing the work that you need to do today to experience the goodness and the grace of God that Jesus offers to everybody. Let's continue back in the story, um, picking back up in verse 6. We read, About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. And so a denarius, by the way, is a, it was in that time a day's wage, roughly. And so grace surprises us in this story that it's available to any and all of us. Because to be a day laborer and waiting in the marketplace at 5 p.m. would reveal a, a, a desperation uh, in, in life. Because again, the day laborer economy, 
is if you don't get work that day, you don't eat that day. And so to still be hanging around at 5 p.m. means you, do, you don't have a lot of options. You are in a desperate place. And in that place, God's grace can meet us. If we're in a place of desperation because of our regret, God's grace is big enough to meet us there. And the story, right, that Jesus tells, tells us that, man, life is not about reward uh, and unfairness here. This is not what's going on. And we can often misinterpret grace. Because what does Jesus have to say to, to those of us who've worked hard? I've done the right thing my whole life and others just need to not be lazy and undisciplined. What are the words that Jesus has for us? If that's the lens, if that's the mindset that we view others through, what does Jesus have to say to us? Pick back up in verse 11 with me. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who've borne the burden of work in the heat of day. But he answered one of them, am I not being unfair to you, friend? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you being envious because I am so generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. And so here's really the crux and the point of the story. That everything that we have is something we have received from God, not earned, in terms of God's economy, in terms of how he works. He is the landowner in the story. His vineyard is his kingdom expanding in the world and his will being done. And our contributions are not us earning. We're receiving from God and we live merely as a way to say thank you. Our lives are, are a, one continuous uh, sense of gratitude and generosity because of what God has given us. And so in God's economy, you cannot judge people with a one-size-fits-all lens. It is abundantly clear from the story Jesus is telling that we cannot do that. Instead, you are invited to be a person who is marked by gratefulness and generosity because of the generosity that God has made available to you in your life. And if you're still not convinced, the, the ending of this story, this is a sucker punch from Jesus that hits us just as it hit the audience in the first century. I think it hits us the same way today that those who worked like one twelfth of the day as the other people get the same treatment as the landowner. And that grates on us. And that's the, that's the point that some of us need to hear today, that self-righteousness puts you last in God's economy. That's where we're living. Self-righteousness puts you last in God's, eco in God's economy. Because touting our own ability, right? Believing it's just because of my hard work I am where I am today, Jesus has words for that mindset, and we need to reckon with that. If you are like me, both literally and figuratively, an early morning worker, it's important for us to realize that life consequences are not always tied to the failure to do the work. There's a tendency in our circles to think that, well, when people's lives are off track, it's, it's their fault because they're just being lazy. If they would just work hard, there would be a different set of circumstances for, for them. We don't know if the, if the late workers are late because they were messing around in life. It could be. Or it could be that they were not afforded the same opportunities that we were. Or that there are physical or social disadvantages that the other workers didn't face. In fact, in the story, right, these late workers, the 5 p.m. worker was passed over probably for a good reason, right? They were not the best worker to be picked. Uh, they had some sort of disability or limitation or disadvantage that made them not the ideal person to pick and why no one would hire them. And this can often work the same way in our world today. The early worker, right? We think I'm here because of my merit or because of, you know, that, that, that's all there is. End of story. And I fail to look at, were there other advantages that God entrusted to me? Were there other privileges that God gave me and that I need to steward those on behalf of others? So if you're an early worker, don't resent God for his grace. Become more gracious like God is. You know, continue to sacrifice your privileges, your position for others who are not there to invite them in, to help them experience what you've experienced. If you're a late worker, 
You, you regret over not getting started, again, professionally and personally in your relationships or financially or emotionally or spiritually in whatever areas. If you didn't get started doing that work, don't let regret keep you from beginning that work today. And if you're late because of how life has gone for you up to this point, both from decisions within your control and apart from your, your control, remember that in God's economy of grace, it is never too late for you to begin. You know, prior church, um, there was an individual and uh, his name was Mike, and Mike came to faith later on in life, um, well into his 40s that, uh, before he came to faith. And Mike lived a, a very sexually promiscuous lifestyle, uh, led a lifestyle that was based upon, you know, enjoying uh, luxuries and, and all of the things that would go with this, with a very, uh, again, uh, seeking pleasure, hedonistic kind of lifestyle. And, and again, that worked for him for a while until things started to unravel, until the shine wore off, until the finances began to dry up, until the relationships began to crumble and fall apart. And God in his grace met Mike in that. It's where he was introduced to the person and the work of Jesus. And Jesus radically transformed Mike's life. And so Mike became one of the most passionate people I have ever met for sharing his faith, for sharing what the grace of God was able to accomplish in his life. And he just wanted other people to know that, right? Because of what Mike experienced and many others have experienced, the grace of God is something that was extended to him, not because of what he did, but in spite of the life he was living, in spite of the regrets, God's grace met him in that. Because in God's economy, we don't work off our debt, okay? We can live out of the full and complete grace that, that has been extended, extended to us in Jesus right now today. And so we serve God because of the lavishness of his grace, because of the way he's met us. And we invite others to that, not in a condemnation way, not in a, in a manipulative way, but we invite people to experience this kind of freedom, to reframe our regrets. And so as we kind of close this message and we're beginning this series today, let me ask you, what is one regret that you would like to be able to reframe in your life, that you would like the grace of God to be able to write a new story around, to help you begin the work that you know you need to do. And so don't, don't look at everything. Don't look at every chapter and be overwhelmed by that. Find the one regret and just ask God, God, would you help me reframe this regret I have around the understanding of the grace that you've extended to me in Jesus? If you have questions about that, if you would love to process that with somebody else, we would love to connect you with a leader here at Rainier View uh, and, and help you work through that. And we would love to hear your story of how you are reframing the regret in your life and seeing how God wants to redeem that moment, that season for good. Don't let regret keep you from doing the good that you know God wants you to pursue today. Have a great week. We hope to see you back here uh, next week as we continue in our series, Yes, Regrets.